Chances are you've heard the age old saying that real estate is the asset class that's created the most millionaires over the past couple hundred years. In fact, billionaire Andrew Carnegie famously said that in his time, 90% of millionaires got their wealth by investing in real estate. Now, of course, back in the late 1800s, there was no concept of tech, crypto, and NFT millionaires like today, where some individuals are now making unfathomable amounts of wealth in a really short burst. But regardless of the fast wealth that technology and the internet have brought on, well, real estate still remains one of the most powerful wealth building asset classes to this day that makes more everyday millionaires than any other asset class. Now, obviously we have no real way of knowing exactly how many current day millionaires got there through investing in property. But what we do know is that investing in real estate is a really powerful way to achieve that first one to upwards of around $10 million of net worth. This chart right here clearly highlights the relative percentage of assets tied up in each investment class categorized by net worth tier. So as we can see, the percentage of net worth tied up in a primary residence and other real estate is quite dominant up until the million dollar range and then drops off significantly because most higher net worth individuals have business interest that makes up a larger portion of their net worth. So this right here is the exact reason why billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg's net worth can fluctuate by billions of dollars in a single day because the largest portion of their net worth is tied up in public equity shares. Anyways, I'm getting a bit off topic here. So I absolutely love real estate for multiple different reasons and it's one of my favorite asset classes to invest in. Now, the other day, one of my friends was over for dinner. Of course, we were chatting about investing and more specifically, real estate investing because he was really interested in starting to get into it. Now, after a long conversation about why I truly believe it's one of the most versatile asset classes for everyday people to grow wealth over time, I thought, you know what, this would be a great video to make on the channel and share with everyone else and why over time a much higher percentage of individuals who do invest in real estate end up becoming millionaires. Let's first remember here that one of the key elements in successful investing comes down to capital allocation as well as risk mitigation, but then also opportunity cost. So if I have $10,000 worth to invest and I put it in one investment over another, well, each one of these investments is going to have a different risk profile most likely and also have an expected different return. So utilizing your capital appropriately based on your investor profile and where you're at in life is going to be really important in successfully investing over the long term as well as building your wealth over time. And for me, real estate has been time and time again, one of the best ways for me to allocate my capital with really consistent and steady returns that I'm able to estimate on a much more concrete basis than any other asset class like stocks, bonds, ETFs, etc. So we're gonna be speaking about a ton of different things in today's video, going over the wealth building principles of real estate, but then also backing each one of these up with a concrete example of my own real estate investments over the past couple of years to see how this stacked up. All right, so starting off with the wealth building pillars of real estate, it's important to first realize that when calculating real estate returns, there's a lot more that goes into this calculation in contrast to equity returns. Starting with that first pillar, we have a cash flows and the cash on cash return that's gonna look at the cash flows of a property relative to your investment in it. So cash flows, you can think of these as the dividends of real estate investing, where this is the money that's going to be left over once you've paid off all of the expenses on a property from the income that you incurred. Now, when when it comes to calculating the cash flows on a given piece of property, the income as well as the expenses can be broken down into multiple different subcategories, but fundamentally it is just the income minus the expenses on the property monthly that is going to be your monthly cash flows. Now, personally, any of the deals I've done over the past three years always has to be cash flowing from day one, meaning when I'm buying the property, the income needs to fully cover the expenses on the property, even before optimizing it further by raising rents, updating the property aesthetically, raising its value, et cetera. These are all things that can also raise the property's value that we're going to be speaking about shortly. But from day one, I want the cash flows to be positive because this is going to allow me to cover any unnecessary expenses or any other expense that could arise. All right. So this right here is a cash flow example on a property deal that I did over the past two years. Now the property was a duplex with rents initially of 900 as well as $800 per month. I had the intention of going and living in that property though, which I did do while I was 
was transitioning away from uh, being a renter, purchased a property to build some equity, house hack, and then eventually transition over into a home. So that's a strategy that I deployed, but initially with rent of $900 and $800 a month, the mortgage as well as the other expenses on the property were $1,323 a month, as well as all of the rest came out to cash flow of negative $20 per month. Now, I just said earlier that I like to purchase property that is cash flow positive day one. Reason why in this case I made an exception was because really I did have that intention of going in and living in it. And then once I would leave, I would re rent that unit for more than it was rented at previously. So that's exactly what happened. Left that unit and ended up renting it for $1,200 a month. And then at that point, it was cash flowing $296 per month. And then finally, for the cash flows, we can calculate the cash on cash return. This essentially takes the yearly cash flows of a property and divides that by the total investment that you put into said property. So in this case, once it was optimized, I had rental revenue of 3000 or cash flows, I should say of $3,560 a year. And my initial out of pocket, that total investment, taking into account the down payment and all other closing costs was just under 21,000, meaning that 3560 divided by that 21,000, give or take, had a cash on cash return of 17%. Now, of course, the more money that you put down on a property, the lower your cash on cash return is going to be and vice versa. The second wealth building pillar of real estate is what's known as equity pay down and building equity in your property through paying down your mortgage loan each and every month. And the beauty with this is that unlike with say your primary residence with a rental property, it is your tenants that are paying down your mortgage, basically meaning it's other people purchasing assets on your behalf. And then from the equity pay down in a year, we can also calculate what's known as the equity returns for a given period. So again, this is really simple to understand. And if you have a house, this is a concept that you're probably familiar with, but every single month when you have a mortgage, a portion of your mortgage payment is going towards interest and a portion is going towards equity. So every single month when you make that payment successfully, you are building equity in a property and it's like a forced savings account. And in the current interest rate environment where interest rates are extremely low, most individuals are able to lock in rates below two, 3%. Well, this means that the cost of borrowing is significantly cheaper. So every month when you're making that payment, that mortgage payment, a much larger percentage of it is going towards equity, thus meaning higher equity returns in a property. So right here is an example of another duplex deal that I purchased and sold last year. Ended up holding it for a much shorter period of time than I was hoping, but the market had just appreciated a lot. So I decided to offload that property, take some capital back, put it into another deal. Now, the mortgage payments monthly on that property were just above $1,000 and considering the, what was it? 1.64% interest rate on that mortgage loan. We were looking at principal pay down of $667 per month. And then interest on that was 336. So we can see here that every single month, the tenants were paying down that mortgage. And then there was $667 give or take of equity being built up in that property. And similar to calculating the cash on cash return for a property's cash flows, when it comes to calculating the equity returns, we take the equity being built up in the property over that 12 month period and dividing it by the investment that you put in to said property. Now, before jumping into the third wealth building pillar of real estate, I want to quickly mention here that cash flows and equity pay down are what I like to call the guaranteed returns when it comes to a piece of property. And of course, nothing is guaranteed. And again, if a tenant was to miss payments, well, of course, that's going to eat away at your returns. However, if you have good tenants and good business structures surrounding your rental property business, well, the cash flows as well as the equity pay down are almost guaranteed each and every month. And that's something that I really like about real estate investing where you can almost guarantee a certain level of return not taking into account any of the other things that we're about to speak of whereas for example in parallel to this uh, equity returns are really based on the movements of the market that are completely out of your control i like being able to guarantee on multiple of the property deals i've done over the past two to three years 10 15 30 percent guaranteed returns on my investment before taking into account a natural appreciation and forced appreciation that we'll be speaking about right now. So of course, let's now speak about wealth milling pillar number three, and that is appreciation. And appreciation comes in two forms. The first one being natural appreciation that most people think of when they think about real estate returns. And the second is what's known as forced appreciation. Okay, so starting with natural appreciation, quite simply, this is just the appreciation on a year over year basis of the average home price in a given market. So if you live, for example, in the Toronto market or the Miami market, this is going to be different based 
based on, well, the market that you're in, where on a yearly basis, the average price for, say, a condo, a townhome, a rental property, a triplex, whatever, is going to appreciate by a given amount, give or take, on an average year. So we can see from this chart, for example, the average home price across Canada has gone up quite consistently over the past, you know, 100 years. Even though over the past two to three years, the natural appreciation of properties has skyrocketed in parallel to other markets like the equity market, crypto, and all that as a result of the pandemic and the monetary policy. But regardless, that is what natural appreciation is. The issue when it comes to natural appreciation, though, is that I like to just see this as icing on the cake, where, as I just mentioned earlier, the guaranteed returns from the cash flows and the equity pay down are what I like to look at when making a property investment. And then natural appreciation is just icing on top. And then from there also, I like to uh, do strategic renovations to a property for what's known as forced appreciation. Quickly before jumping into forced appreciation though, that typical narrative of, oh, well, real estate tends to appreciate by less than the stock market on a year over year basis, and therefore returns are lower. That is true when it comes to natural appreciation, where over the past, you know, 100 years, if you look at real estate returns, it's usually been three to around 5% on average per year, which does happen to be lower than the American stock market. But that's only taking into account natural appreciation and not taking into account those cash flow returns as well as the equity pay down returns. So it's really when we take a look at the entire picture here and take everything into account to calculate our real rate of return that we can see that usually real estate is able to create much higher returns on a more guaranteed basis than other asset classes. Oh, and that's not to mention the fact also that natural appreciation is on the entire value of the home, where even if, let's say, a property is going up 5% in a given year, which might be lower than the stock market in a given year, well, with real estate, you're able to leverage up your money, where let's say just really simple numbers here, you bought a property for $500,000, you put 20% down, meaning out of pocket, you're only looking at $100,000, which is still a lot, but you're then looking at natural appreciation of 5% on the entire $500,000 asset and not the $100,000 that you put into, let's say, the stock market. So you're able to leverage up your capital and then take advantage of natural appreciation on a much larger asset value. And then finally, appreciation 2.0 is what's called forced appreciation. And this is where I've been able to make the most money in my deals over the past couple of years. But this is a lot more active and it's more of a business than an investment. I will concede that. But forced depreciation essentially you're raising the value of the property considering that you got it at a really good price by doing strategic renovations to the unit and hopefully also being able to increase the amount of rent that you're getting per unit when it comes to a rental property the value unlike say a home is a lot more tied to the rent of that property so if a property is bringing in a thousand dollars per month well this is typically going to be worth a lot less than a property that's bringing in two thousand dollars per month of course this becomes a lot more complicated and there is literally hundreds and hundreds of factors that come into play when calculating the after repair value of a property that you're force appreciating. But let's just take a look at a quick deal that I did here over the past two years. Okay, so this deal was a fourplex that I purchased for $340,000. Now, initially, this fourplex was rented severely under market rent on two to three of the units. And luckily, and this was just pure luck, I will concede that, when we were purchasing the property, two of the tenants were leaving in the next couple of months for different various reasons. So they, those tenants did leave. One of them, I'm pretty sure, was renting for $800 a month, if I remember correctly. It was a three-bedroom. And then the other, I, if I remember correctly, was around $600, uh, I believe. Now, once those tenants ended up leaving, this was an opportunity to do aesthetic renovations and raise the perceived value of those units and rent them for more. So that's exactly what ended up happening. You know, slap a coat of paint everywhere, put do a couple renovations here and there. And then from there, we were able to rent those units out for $750, so $150 more, as well as $1,150. So that was, what would that be? $350 more than what it was rented for before. Now, as I said earlier, when it comes to a rental property, yes, there are other factors that come into play when looking at the value of the property, but the rents are really important. And so by raising the rents of the property, you're essentially having a direct impact on the value of that property in the market. So in this particular case, that property in that given area was fetching around 12 times annual revenues for the market value of a property. Basically just taking the yearly rents of a property and multiplying those by 12 gives you a rough estimate of what that 
that rental property could be worth. So if you think of it by raising the value of the rent by what was it, 350 as well as $150, we're looking at $500 a month extra in cash flows. And if we multiply those by 12 for the entire year, we're looking at $6,000 a year extra in rental revenue. Now multiplying that by 12 again for the average rent multiple in that area, that raised the value of the property by around $70,000. Now that property was also cash flowing around $1,400 a month and it was also building, what was it, around $730 worth of equity every single month. Fast forward around a year and a half now, just sold that property a couple weeks back and sold it for $515,000. So really, this is what I love about real estate. There's so many different ways to create a return on your investment. We have the wealth building pillars, but then we also have all the different possibilities for raising the value of the property in the marketplace. And I would argue that it's really the flexibility of real estate that's allowed it to create more millionaires than any other asset class. All right, so let's now jump into the second section of today's video being the real estate quadrant, which is kind of like a play on the rich dad, poor dad cash flow quadrant, but this is in relation to property and rental property investments. And if you aren't familiar with rich dad, poor dad's cash flow quadrant, it's essentially a way of dividing people up into four different categories. The first one being an employee, the second one being a self-employed, and then on the other side of the quadrant, we have business owners, and then below that, we have investors. So employees and self-employed people are people who are pretty much trading their time for money. And then on the other side, we have investors and business owners that have systems in place to create income for them. And when it comes to the real estate quadrant though, this is something that I actually picked up from Thatch, who's a real estate investor down in Southern California. I just really thought this was a great way of looking at different properties and categorizing them differently. So let's take a look right now. The first type of rental property here would have appreciation, but no cash flow. And depending on your current market might be the reality of things. So usually this is the type of property that you're going to find in larger metropolitan areas where there is a lot of appreciation, but very little cash flow opportunities. And this is an okay property to invest in. Now, the second one is no appreciation, but cash flow. This is usually going to be in B markets where you're looking at properties that might be able to have higher rents relative to the expenses, but the appreciation of the properties naturally is somewhat limited because there might be less population as well as job growth. The third category is no appreciation and no cash flow, and this should go without saying that this is a property to avoid at all costs because what's the point of investing in a property that's not yielding you any cash flows and it's not appreciating in value? You're pretty much only getting the equity pay down from the tenants, but this, depending on the property, can be a lot more work uh, relative to to the return and it might not be worth it at that point. If you're looking at matching, say, S&P 500 returns, it's a lot better to just do a really passive S&P 500 ETF investment than an active or more active, I should say, real estate investment for a lower return. And then finally, we have the fourth category, which is the holy grail here, appreciation as well as positive cash flow. And this is what you want to try and find as a real estate investor, where you're buying a property that's in a market that's growing, there's drop growth, and so for this reason, the actual natural appreciation is going up, but then also you're able to get significant cash flows to maybe fund your lifestyle or also fund other deals at a quicker pace. And then also taking into account the equity pay down from the tenants, this all together is going to create the holy grail of a real estate investment. And that's really what I try to look for in a property where I have all three of those elements and also I'm able to force appreciate the property by renovating it strategically. So again, depending on the market that you currently live in and are you you're looking to invest in those, some of these types of properties might not be feasible, again, depending on your location. So looking at, well, what am I trying to get out of my rental property investing business? This is going to be the first step. And then from there, trying to identify a market that might be suitable for your investment goals. All right, so let's now talk about the power of compounded returns in real estate, because we speak about compound interest a lot when it comes to stock market investing. But what a lot of people fail to realize is that this also fully applies to any other asset class if you're consistent with your investments. Specifically, real estate, this is one that takes full advantage of compounded returns over the years that you're holding a property and paying it off. So when it comes to compounded real estate investing returns, though, typically this is also going to be on a much quicker pace
case than other asset classes because again other individuals are paying down your asset and buying assets for you so this then means that you are only putting the money up front to purchase the property one single time and then over the years as more equity is being built up in the property you're able to also access that equity and reutilize it for investing in other assets thus compounding that process and it really becomes sort of a domino effect where you can start utilizing the equity in each one of your properties to reinvest into other properties thus growing the value of your portfolio significantly okay so let's now circle back to the title of today's video being why real estate investors are all millionaires and of course not every real estate investor is a millionaire but the basic concepts that we covered in today's video are a clear-cut blueprint to creating millionaires over the long term if you have that long-term approach with real estate investing and in really simple terms let's just say someone who wants to be a bit more passive with the real estate investing and you're purchasing four to five properties over the course of 10 to 15 years of investing and that's really passive you can do this on a much quicker basis if you really put your mind to it. But someone who purchases four to five properties other than their primary residence, just in terms of sheer basis of what a millionaire is, in terms of having a net worth of a million dollars or more, well, this is highly achievable through other individuals paying down that mortgage and building equity in the property. Once they're fully paid off, you're looking at multiple different properties that are cash flowing at that point thousands of dollars per month and in terms of equity value you have well over a million dollars worth of equity in your portfolio now i can already see people down in the comments commenting that real estate investing is a lot more work you're going to be scrubbing toilets you're going to be dealing with nightmare tenants that is very possible and i will not deny the fact that it is a lot more work investing in real estate than investing in say the stock market where you can buy stocks directly from your phone in my own experience though yes there have been multiple periods where I needed to problem solve. It was a lot of work being on site, dealing with tenants, doing strategic renovations. But if you want to take advantage of everything we spoke about in today's video, there is going to be a bit more work required. That is just the name of the game. And at the end of the day, nothing in life worth doing is easy. By the way, an alternative to physical real estate investing, even though I strongly believe everyone should look to invest in physical real estate over the course of their investing career, another option in the short term, if you want to have exposure to real estate, is what I like to call paper real estate. And there's a couple other uh, different services that offer this in Canada and the United States. In Canada, for example, there's a platform called Addy, where essentially you can buy $1 shares of properties across Canada. Now, they drop a property roughly every two weeks. This video, by the way, is not sponsored by them. And anyway it's just a platform that i have personally used i personally invested into four different properties at this point and they offer different rates of return again this is not real real estate because you don't have access to the cash flows the equity pay down everything else that comes with refinancing properties selling them but this is a way that you can gain access to specific properties across canada and if you sign up with my link down below you can get 25 dollars simply for signing up and if you're in the united states another platform that's very similar is called fundrise i'll also leave a link down in the description to that. So we covered a lot in today's video and these are the main reasons why most rental property owners become millionaires over time. Rental properties though are not a short-term investment. This is something that you should be looking at building wealth over the long term. But if you're able to stay consistent with those investments over a long enough period of time, taking advantage of those cash flows, the equity pay down, the appreciation, maybe some forced appreciation, all of this combined can really create some true wealth for you over the long term and that is why I personally love real estate investing and will continue to do so over the long term. If you enjoyed today's video make sure to smash the like button it really helps my channel out and if you want to learn more about rental property investing as well as stock market investing make sure to subscribe hit the bell button to be notified of new and upcoming content and on that note I will see you in the next video.